Well, hi there. This is a primate. And so is this. And so is this. And so is this. And this primate is a monkey. And so is this. And so is this. And so is this. Hey, that's me. What's, what's going on here? From a phylogenetic standpoint, humans can be considered a type of monkey within the larger primate clade. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, AI. So humans are monkeys? In modern taxonomic and common usage, humans are not referred to as monkeys. The distinction reflects significant evolutionary, morphological, and cognitive differences that have emerged since the human lineage diverged from other primates. Oh, okay. So organisms can evolve out of a clade. No, an organism cannot evolve out of a clade. In phylogenetics, uh, a clade represents a group of organisms that includes a single common ancestor and all its descendants. Once an organism is part of a particular clade, all of its descendants will also belong to that clade, regardless of how much they change or diversify over time. Okay, well, um, ChatGPT was a bit conflicted about whether or not humans are monkeys, but this is a question that hits me real close to the heart. It cost me a year of my life. I've just sucked one year of your life away. Because I got into a debate about this very point with a member of my PhD committee right in the middle of my dissertation defense. Who else is part of the smallest monophyletic group that includes both the Old World and New World monkeys? Okay, I think you're ready to chat. Chat with each other now. All right, so who, who else would be part of this group? Owen, who would you have? Gorillas, chimpanzees, and no So, anybody else, by the way? Gorillas, and all of their ancestors. And all of their ancestors. Does that make sense? Okay, so now here's the question. Just discuss this immediately with the person next to you. Do we come from monkeys? <laughs> in fact, if there is a monophyletic group called That's a monkeys, bad question. who's in it? I just think we're specifically by monkeys. <laughs> well, if there's such a thing as a monophyletic group from monkeys that includes all the monkeys, so what do you guys think? I say no. You say no? All right, let's have it. Why not? Because you're not sure that that ancestor is a monkey. Yeah. Okay, is That's it part of the group monkeys? That's why I said you're being more specific about what you mean by monkeys. Well, I'm, in this case, I would just be talking about the monophyletic group that includes all monkeys. That would be the smallest group I can make called monkeys. Are they in it? Is there a common ancestor that you share in it or not? I guess what the point I'm making is you don't know what those ancestors are. Are those ancestors all monkeys too? That was a bit hard to watch. So that is the question. Are those ancestors all monkeys too? And since this question has cost me so much, and because the answer is so interesting, let's talk about all of the primates, how they're related, and whether or not you might be a monkey's uncle. And since we're gonna be digging into the phylogenetic relationships of primates and trying to answer some very controversial questions, what's better, a monophyletic group or a paraphyletic group. Monophyletic groups or clades are favored in phylogenetics because they include a common ancestor and all its descendants, providing a complete picture of evolutionary relationships. Paraphyletic groups include a common ancestor but not all its descendants, and polyphyletic groups don't include the most recent common ancestor of its members. Both paraphyletic and polyphyletic groups give an incomplete or misleading view of evolutionary history, making monophyletic groups more valuable for understanding and representing evolutionary relationships accurately. Okay, so what we want are monophyletic groups, clades, a common ancestor, and all of its descendants. Well, good news. Primates are a clade, a monophyletic group, a common ancestor, and all of its descendants. And as we learned earlier, no matter how different the descendants become from their shared ancestors, it is impossible to evolve out of a clade. That would be paraphyly. We don't want that. Primates themselves are part of a larger clade called primatomorpha, which includes all of the primates, a group called dermoptera, often called flying lemurs, the last common ancestors of primates and dermopterans, and everything in between. And guess what? Those common ancestors and all of their descendants are all 
primatomorphs. That's the way monophyly works. One of the major advantages of monophyly is that it teaches me things about the members of the groups that I didn't know before I put them into the groups. It has massive predictive power. I didn't need to know all of their names to know that they were all primatomorphs, including all of the primates. And that is the way that a nested hierarchy works. The primates are a large clade that is nested within larger clades, such as primatomorpha. All primates are primatomorphs, but not all primatomorphs are primates. Primates are also nested within many other larger groups, such as the eutheria, the mammalia, the tetrapoda, the vertebrata, the chordata, and the animalia. And most people don't seem to have a problem with the fact that humans are nested within these groups. It isn't highly controversial that humans are mammals, vertebrates, or eutherians, for example. But if you bring up that humans are bony fishes or animals, some people, and even artificial intelligences, push back. And saying that we are monkeys is a bridge too far even for some evolutionary biologists, apparently. But are we monkeys? Well, let's start with primates. Primates can be identified by their relatively large brains, large, forward-facing eyes, opposable digits on their hands and or feet, and nails as opposed to claws. The primates form two clades, the haplorini and the strepsorini. And right here, I want to address a major misconception that many people have. The haplorini and the strepsorini are both equally evolved. Because evolution only has one goal, the survival of genes. And since all individuals die, this means that the goal of organisms is to pass their genes on to future generations. Many individuals may not know that this is the goal, and they may not succeed at doing so. And the result of this is that the genes of individuals that stink at achieving this goal are not well represented in future generations. The genes that make it to future generations are disproportionately and non-randomly the genes that assist with that one goal. Though random forces can have an impact too, especially in small populations, or with respect to what mutations occur and when. But by and large, Gene variants that increase the likelihood of an individual possessing them, achieving the goal of passing on its genes, become more prevalent over generations. Importantly, being a human is not the only way to achieve this goal. And the more similar you are to humans, the more directly you compete with them. What I'm saying is that other organisms are not failed attempts at becoming humans, nor is there a particular evolutionary pressure to become more like humans. If anything, the opposite is true. Humans are great at being humans, but they make lousy strepsorines. Strepsorines are identifiable by their wet noses, like those of a dog or a cat. Though strepsorini means something like turned around nose or turned around nostrils, in reference to their comma-shaped nostrils. They also make their own vitamin C. Remember that. It's important. And not just because you need vitamin C. So you do, you scurvy dog. Which is an odd thing to call somebody, because dogs make their own vitamin C. In fact, almost all mammals make their own vitamin C. Very few do not. But we'll talk more about them in a moment. So like dogs, strepsorines make their own vitamin C and have wet noses, which greatly increases olfactory ability. And the strepsorine clade itself is divided into two large groups. The lemuroidea, lemurs, endemic to Madagascar, and the lorisoidea, the lorises and bush babies of Africa and Asia. Lemurs are such a rad group that they could definitely get their own video at some point. Now, lemur means ghost. There are around a hundred species in Madagascar, eight distinct families, ranging in size from about 30 grams, about a fifteenth of a pound, to around nine kilos, 20 pounds. That's now. When humans arrived on the island around 2,000 years ago, there were lemurs the size of gorillas. They are basically the monkeys of Madagascar, though they aren't monkeys. But they're rather convergently similar in many ways, since there were no monkeys in Madagascar until we showed up. So all of the monkey niche space it was wide open, and the lemurs filled it. Now, you're unlikely to confuse most lemurs with monkeys, and not just because of their location, wet, comma, noses, and vitamin C synthesis, but because their faces tend to look more like those of carnivorans than those of monkeys, with long, pointed snouts and ears that look more like a dog's than they do like, well, 
yours, generally. Though that breaks down a bit with some groups, like the sportive lemurs, and my favorite lemur, the Ai Ai, which looks more like a gremlin. And not one of those happy gremlins. It's a monster. I love it. Now, most lemurs have front teeth called tooth combs. Not just them, but also the lorisoids that we will discuss soon. And the flying lemurs, so it may be the ancestral condition of the primatomorpha. Anyway, the eye eye, it doesn't have one. Instead, they have some crazy paired continuously growing incisors. The skull looks like what you would get if you crossed a rodent with a parrot. Those incisors be crazy. But why be they crazy, Clint? Oh. I'm so glad you asked. Because eye eyes are woodpeckers. But instead of pecking holes in trees, they chew holes in trees. And why make holes in trees? Because there are tasty insect morsels in there. But how do they know where they are? You ask the best questions. They listen for them with their hideous grumpy gremlin ears and their long freaky knocking finger. Look at that finger. It isn't really so much long as it is skinny and terrifying. And it is terrifying. That knock is one of the scariest sounds a grub could ever hear. That and Hakuna Matata. Once it has located a grub, it chews a small hole in the tree and then inserts the spider leg death finger into the hole, hooks the disappointed larva within, and then hauls it out so that it can be masticated and ingested. What a wonderful beast. Now, I mentioned that the largest of all lemurs was about the size of a gorilla. And that's true. They were called sloth lemurs. But the largest extant lemur is the Indri, a close relative of the extinct giant sloth lemurs. And in addition to being large and colored like a panda, they also have a very short tail. Like a bear, but interestingly, not much like a panda. Pandas have huge tails for bears. But I want to ask you a question. If the descendants of Indris eventually lost all external vestiges of their tails, would they cease to be lemurs? No, an organism cannot evolve out of a clade. Oh yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we have a pretty good idea how to distinguish lemurs from monkeys. But what about from their closest relatives, the members of the clade Lorisoidea? Well, a good place to start is by asking yourself the age-old question, am I in Madagascar? That should handle the question, but to be perfectly honest, unless you have the ability to examine its DNA or look at its internal anatomy, it's otherwise pretty difficult to answer this question. This is a bush baby, also called a galago. It's adorable. It obviously has big front-facing eyes, somewhat opposable thumbs and fingernails. It's a primate. It has a pair of wet commas, so you can probably guess about whether or not it can synthesize vitamin C. It can. And you could double check yourself by looking for a tooth comb. It has one. This is a slow loris. Same deal. But in addition to that, it also has a toxic bite, used primarily in slow motion battles with other slow lorises. But you know what it doesn't have? A visible tail. And you know what that means? It's no longer a member of the lorisoidea. It evolved right out of that clade, right? Of course not. It just doesn't have a tail. They could evolve to not have a head, and that wouldn't change the fact that the descendants of the first lorisoids will always be lorisoids. If you're in Asia or Africa and you find a soggy commonailer with or without a tail, you'll know that you have a member of the lorisoidea. But the Stripserini is really not the primate lineage that we're most interested in exploring, because the monkeys are part of the other big primate lineage, the Haplorini, the simple-nosed primates with dry, non-common noses, and no ability to synthesize vitamin C. These are the scurvy primates. And scurvy probably doesn't increase your likelihood of passing on your genes. So why hasn't this been a problem? Well, largely because most primates have diets rich in vitamin C. Haplorines might not make it, but that wasn't really an issue. They didn't need to make their own. Not an issue, at least until primates started to live in places where foods rich in vitamin C were uncommon. Especially, say, at sea for months at a time. But there is a reason that I bring it up. What is the simplest explanation for why this entire clade would lack the ability to synthesize vitamin C? All of them. Now, it could have happened multiple times and been successful, or at least not devastating, repeatedly. But the simplest explanation is that the mutation occurred in the haplorine lineage somewhere after the split 
from the strypsorine and reached fixation in the population before the first split within that lineage. Of course, just because it's the simplest, that doesn't make it true. So how would you know? Well, the enzyme needed to synthesize vitamin C is coded for by a gene called GULO. And the GULO gene is roughly 22,000 base pairs long. If it is broken, it won't make vitamin C. And the likelihood of the same exact break happening independently in two different lineages is astronomically small. Guinea pigs are one of a small number of other mammals that have a mutation to their GULO gene, resulting in a lack of vitamin C production. Unsurprisingly, it is a different break from that found in haplorines, which makes sense. Same thing goes for the bats that don't produce vitamin C. It's a different break from the one that you find in guinea pigs or in haplorines. But what about among the haplorines? Well, it's the exact same break straight across the board. And again, it happened before the first haplorine lineage diversified from the rest. That first lineage to diversify away after this break would be the Tarsiaformes today represented exclusively by the family Tarsiidae of maritime Southeast Asia, the Tarsiers. Now, the first thing that you might notice about Tarsiers is that their rostrum is much more flat than that of the Strepsirini, reflecting the fact that these are less reliant on olfaction. But that's not the first thing that you noticed. Was it? It was those colossal freaking eyeballs that they've got. If not, you're probably just listening to this video because how could you miss them? They're enormous. In fact, in many cases, each individual eye is larger than their entire brain. And these guys are haplorines. They aren't small brained. They're just giant eyed. I mean, look at the skull of this thing. Where would you even put a brain? But somehow that wasn't the feature that caught the proportionally tiny eyes of the researchers who named them. Tarsier is due to their long foot bones called tarsals, which give them very long legs, or more accurately, very long feet. But I'm not done with those eyes yet. Because if you look at them, they are always looking directly forward with the most intense stare you have ever seen in your entire life. Though owls may give them a run for their money. Because owls, like tarsiers, are always looking straight ahead. You have never seen such determination in the eyes of anything else. And there is a good reason that they never side-eye anything. They can't. Their eyes are too big. The muscles required to move those eyes would be huge and heavy. Not good for a bird or a primate. So they can't. They can see really well, but only what is straight in front of their faces. Which means that if they're going to see, say, uh, behind them, well, they will need to turn their whole head backwards, like some sort of possessed wide-eyed cowboy doll. We toys can see everything. Now they can't do the full cowboy, but they can spin it all the way to the rear, 180 degrees, giving them the ability to see in any direction without moving their bodies. And somehow, vision might not be their primary tool when hunting. Like owls, tarsiers are nocturnal and rely heavily on their hearing. They have big, thin ears like a bat, and their brains are particularly adept at processing auditory information. It really is like a wizard tried to make an insect-eating owl out of a leaping monkey. Mission accomplished. But it isn't a monkey. And that gets us to our mission. Monkeys. And uh, are you a monkey's uncle? Oh, and just by the way, all of our patrons get access to a video that includes an epic rant about the scam that is the modern education system. So if you're interested in seeing that video, please consider checking us out on Patreon. Everything we have discussed so far can easily be excluded from the smallest clade that includes all of the monkeys. But now we are moving into the clade Semiaformes, and the group of Semiaformes least related to all of the others is a clade of monkeys. And I think it is fair to say that a clade of monkeys cannot be removed from the smallest clade that includes all of the monkeys. Do we need to verify that with AI or 
Are we all on the same page? So monkeys are monkeys. Okay, I'm gonna work under the assumption that we can agree that monkeys are monkeys. And this clade, the platterini, the flat or broad-nosed monkeys, are monkeys. Because flat-nosed monkeys live exclusively in the Americas, and because they are the only simians native to the Americas, they are often referred to as New World monkeys. The other clade in the simiaformes, the Caterini, being entirely from the Old World, are often called the Caterine monkeys, or the Old World monkeys, though the latter is often applied exclusively to one single clade of Caterine monkeys, and uh, we'll get to them soon enough. But what we can see is that the two remaining clades in this lineage, they're both monkeys. New World and Old World monkeys. For the moment, let's talk about New World monkeys, the Platterini. Today there are five living families of New World monkeys. Like all simians, New World monkeys have large, but not insanely large, and therefore movable, eyes with great daytime color vision accompanied by large brains that specialize in visual perception more than olfaction. Interestingly, while both the New World and Old World monkeys have large brains, even for primates, they seem to have evolved those larger brains independently from one another. Which isn't the case for their lack of ability to synthesize vitamin C. They both seem to have inherited that from the same haplorene ancestor. And I know that because, once again, all of the haplorines look to have inherited it from the same common ancestor. And the last common ancestor of all haplorines, as well as all of their descendants, so everything from that point until now, have all been haplorines. And I know this because that's how monophyletic groups work. You probably get this, but I have encountered evolutionary biologists that seem to still struggle with this concept, so I'm just being really explicit. So what makes New World monkeys unique from Old World monkeys other than geography? Well, let's start with their noses. Their names both refer to their noses. New World monkeys are the Platterini, the flat-nosed monkeys. And the Old World monkeys are the Caterini, the down-nosed monkeys. It really just has to do with the position of the nostrils. New World monkeys have side pipes, like a Dodge Viper, a Shelby Cobra, or a 427 Corvette. American cars, American monkeys. Not every American car has side pipes, but face it, you'd be shocked to see side pipes on a Ferrari, a BMW, or a Toyota. Know why? Because the old world doesn't do side pipes. Old world monkeys point down. Well, unless they're snub-nosed monkeys that have the same plastic surgeon as Michael Jackson, and Skeletor, and He Who Shall Not Be Named, and Red Skull. Those last two are from the old world. I'm really not sure if the first two are even from this world. Great dancing, though. But the point is that New World monkey nostrils point out the side, not down. And so there is a much greater space between the nostrils. They are also the only monkeys that have prehensile tails. Not all of them have prehensile tails, but you'll never see a prehensile tail with downpipes. Prehensile tails have actually evolved two different times in New World monkeys, but never in the Old World. They also have 12 premolars instead of 8, but that can be difficult to count at the zoo. It would be fun to do a whole video just about this group. But right now, we're on a mission. And that mission will require us to dig into the down-nosed Old World monkeys of the Caterini. Now, you probably already know how to distinguish these guys. They have all of the attributes of other simians, and can be distinguished from the New World monkeys by their nostrils that don't point out the sides, as well as the fact that they have eight premolars. And they never have prehensile tails. Some don't have tails at all. Which, as you know, means that they've evolved right out of the clade. No, an organism cannot evolve out of a clade. Oh yeah, silly me. Anyway, they also tend to have flatter finger and toenails, and much more opposable thumbs, unless they've lost their thumbs, which means that they have lost their thumbs. That's it. Colobus monkeys are still monkeys. Because you can't evolve out of a clade no matter what you lose, unless it's all of your ancestors. It's a heck of a thing to lose. So you can identify a Caterine monkey with or without a tail or thumbs. Thumbs up if you've got them. So what's in this group? Well, these and these. 
Monkeys! See the narrow septum between the nostrils? Now, did you notice that one of them didn't have a tail? And remember what that means? Yeah, it means that it doesn't have a tail. Now, there are two different lineages of Catarine monkeys. The Cercopithecoidea and the Hominoidea. This guy is a Cercopithecoid, and this guy is a Hominoid. The easiest way to distinguish between the two is to look for the tail. Hominoids don't have them. Cercopithecoids do. There are other differences if you get a good look at the cusps of their molars, but the presence or absence of a tail is the best giveaway, though it's not exactly foolproof. Barbary macaques and crested black macaques, for example, are cercopithecoids, and their tails are tiny to non-existent, which means that they, they have no tails. Anyway, the cercopithecoids are often referred to as the old world monkeys, but as you may recall, that name was already taken by the Caterini. And given that Cercopithecoids are part of this group, and that all of the Caterini is an entirely old world group, the question as to which group most deserves the title is simply whether or not all members of the Caterini are monkeys, or if only the Cercopithecoids are monkeys. And so we're gonna need to back up and take a look at the phylogeny for just a second. What is a monkey? I think before we agreed that monkeys are monkeys, and therefore New World monkeys, the Platyrrhini, are monkeys. And I've never seen anybody contend that the Cercopithecoids are not monkeys. Can we agree that both of these groups are monkeys? Now, we could very easily say that all primates are monkeys, or all mammals, but that seems a bit overbroad. Let's instead make the smallest possible monophyletic group that we can for monkeys. The smallest group that can be created that includes all of the animals that we all agree are monkeys, their most recent common ancestors, and everything that came from those ancestors, and absolutely nothing else. We will exclude every animal that we possibly can without creating a paraphyletic or polyphyletic group. The smallest monkey clade possible. So what's the last common ancestor shared by both the Platyrrhini and the Cercopithecoidea? Well, that would be uh, these guys right here. The first true monkeys. I'm sure that whatever came before them was very monkey-like, but I can exclude everything before this point from the monkey group, at least if I want to. But not these. These are monkeys. And so is everything that came from them, because that's the way that monophyly works. And if we look at who came from them, you will notice that the Platyrrhini came from them. The Cercopithecoidea, they came from them. And so did the Hominoidea. I can't exclude the Hominoidea from the monkey clade because they share ancestors more recently with the Cercopithecoidea than the Cercopithecoidea do with the Platyrrhini. This means that while I could potentially justify excluding the Platyrrhini from the monkey clade, I cannot exclude the Hominoidea from any clade that includes both Platyrrhini and Cercopithecoidea. It isn't possible. In a nutshell, the Cercopithecoids are not the only Old World monkeys. They are just the only Old World monkeys with tails, even though not all of them have one. So that brings us to the tailless Old World monkeys, the Hominoidea, the man-like Old World monkeys. And what is so man-like about them? Well, like men, they have all of the basic attributes of primates, not to mention the attributes of eutherians, mammals, synapsids, vertebrates, chordates, deuterostomes, bilaterians, etc. So they have relatively large brains, large forward-facing eyes, opposable digits on their hands and or feet, and nails as opposed to claws, like men and every other primate that we've discussed so far. But that is not where their similarities to men end. They also have all of the attributes of haplorine primates. So they have dry noses and can't make vitamin C. And they can't make vitamin C due to the same change in the GULO gene as the one that we see in uh, men and women, just in case you were wondering. But that isn't where the similarities end either. Like men, they also have all of the attributes of simians, which is the smallest clade that can be created that includes all of the monkeys. Attributes such as even larger brains that prioritize vision over olfaction and movable eyes with great color vision. And that's not where it ends. The hominoids also share all of the attributes of Catarine monkeys with men. 
So their nostrils point down and have a small septum between them. They also don't have prehensile tails, and their thumbs are fully opposable, uh, and ate premolars. But that's not where the similarity is in either, because they also share all of the attributes of hominoids. For example, they don't have a tail. But more than that, they don't have a tail for the exact same reason. They all share the same insertion mutation to the TBXT gene that plays a big role in tail vertebrae formation. Do you think that's the same mutation that you see in tailless macaques? I don't think that analysis has been done just yet, but I'd be very surprised if it is. And that's not the full extent of the similarities between hominoids and men, just some of the most conspicuous ones. But plenty enough to help you identify a hominoid when you see one. And plenty enough to justify calling them man-like. So let's dig into these man-like monkeys, and let's start with the least man-like of the man-like monkeys, the Hylobatidae, the forest walkers as opposed to the forest runners. Run, forest, run! Run, forest! Hylobatidae is composed of the roughly 20 species of gibbons. And just at a glance, you can probably distinguish a hylobatid from the other hominoids in the family Hominidae. Hylobatids look much more like the monkeys that we've discussed so far. Just typical, tailless, catarine monkeys that aren't macaques. Macaques have a very distinctive face, in case you're struggling. They're smaller than the other hominoids, and they tend to be built more for swinging around in the trees than are the hominids. Their long arms and ball and socket wrists make them the fastest of all brachiators, tree swingers, and one of the silliest of forest walkers. They also have some key behavioral differences compared to hominids. They tend to pair bond more than hominids, probably leading to reduced levels of sexual difference, sexual dimorphism, compared to hominids. They also do not tend to build nests like the hominids do. And on that note, let's talk about the nest-building, tailless, old-world monkeys in the family Hominidae. The man-like, man-like monkeys. Man-like monkeys are often referred to as apes. And the man-like, man-like monkeys are often referred to as great apes. Possibly because they are bigger. Possibly because they're a little more hanky-panky. And possibly because the more man-like a man-like monkey becomes, the greater we think it is. Though I think it has more to do with the size, because in my opinion, gorillas are greater than bonobos. Even though they're not quite as man-like and... Nothing is more hanky-panky than a bonobo, except for ducks. They're screwed up. Anyway, today there are only eight or nine species of man-like, man-like monkeys. Those are in order of relatedness to the pinnacle of creation, orangutans, three species, hominins, three species, and the pinnacle of creation, gorillas, two or three species. We should do a whole video just diving into these nine species. But right now, we need to dig a bit deeper into the closest relative to the pinnacle of creation, the hominini, the man-like, man-like, man-like monkeys. Not the greatest of the apes, but the most man-like. There are three extant species of man-like, man-like, man-like monkeys in two lineages. Pan, the chimpanzees and bonobos, and Homo, the, well, us. While chimpanzees and bonobos are more closely related to one another than they are to us, and they aren't the closest relatives to us known to have ever existed, they are our closest living relatives, and are more closely related to us than they are to gorillas, orangutans, gibbons, any other monkeys, any other primates, or anything else alive today. Other than the women, they are the most manlike of all primates that aren't men. And the men, while tailless, are nonetheless still great apes, which are still apes, which are still catarine monkeys, which are still monkeys, which are still primates. Because that's the way that monophyly works. And now you know. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Do we mention the name of no. that professor? Mm -mm. He took a real bad position and wrecked a year of my life over it. I didn't I deliberately didn't say his name in this Good. video. Um, or say where he is, what his institution is, or anything like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't want anybody to know that his name is. He no, no, no. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> We're not adding that to Patreon extras. His address is. <laughs> Doxus sucker. Two.